Amen. Are we ready today? How many of you would like more peace this time of year? Anybody? I was uh, looking, and as I was preparing this morning, I found a study that Duke University did on peace of mind. And these are the factors they said that people that have peace of mind in their life, this is what they do or don't do. And it says this, um, these factors include an absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge was a major factor in unhappiness. So if you are nursing a grudge against somebody, you're not going to have peace. Two, not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures leads to depression. So don't think about all your past mistakes, what you've done in the past, because what in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. Right? In Christ, we are new creations. Amen? That's how we have peace. Three, not wasting time and energy fighting conditions you cannot change. Oh, my goodness. Let's take this one to heart. <laughs> Cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it. You know how many times we get all worked up and, and bent out of shape over something that we have zero ability to change? How often we let that to ruin our life or our day or our moment, we get all, we, we let our peace go. Amen? Number four, force yourself to stay involved with the living world, not the Facebook world. Resist the temptation to withdraw and become reclusive on Twitter. During periods of emotional stress, I added those other parts. Oh my goodness, how many times do we get stressed, we feel like, you know, something's wrong, and then we pull away from people instead of finding other people. The word calls us the body of Christ for a reason, right? We, we are each members of it, and if one part is hurting, there are other parts of the body that should, just the way our natural body works, you know, we have these little white blood cells in, running all through our blood, and when an invader comes in that's not supposed to be there, what do they do? They attack it, and they get rid of it, Right? The body works to heal itself, and that's how we should be. Instead of rec being running away, we should find others. Number five, refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Too many times we want to sit down and have a pity party, and that's not going to do anything except the fact that nobody gets through life without some sorrow and misfortune. Anybody seen Guardians of the Galaxy yet? That's one of my favorite movies right now. And there's a guy that's named Rocket. He's like this big raccoon. And someone's having a cry fest. And, and he just said, deal with it. We all have death. You know, this person's, oh, my parents died. You know, he's, it's like this. He just rains down on this guy's pity party right in the middle of everything. And it's, it's pretty funny. But not that you should do that. Don't do that. The Bible says, mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. But don't get stuck mourning all the time just because life doesn't go the way you expect it. Go on. Move, move ahead and live your life. Number six, cultivate the old-fashioned virtues, love, humor, compassion, and loyalty. Mm, there's not enough of those things in our world today. We need more. Love, compassion, humor, and loyalty. Number seven, do not expect too much of yourself. When there's too wide a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet the goals you've set, Feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. So realize who you are. Take an examination of who am I, what can I do, and I'm going to accomplish what I can. Now, there's times we're going to talk about when the Lord calls us to step outside of what we are, and we step into this realm where God is saying, I'm going to, make, I'm going to do something in you that's bigger than you because it's me working through you. And those times you want to grab hold of. What I'm talking about in your everyday life, if you're at work and you know you can only accomplish items A, B, and C, don't make a list of items A, B, C, D, E, and F if you know it's not going to get done that day. Why? Because you're setting yourself up for failure, right, in your life. Number eight, and this is important, find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Self-centered, egotistical people score lowest in any test for measuring happiness. And in our lives, we would say we're going to put our hope and our faith fully and Father God and His Son, Jesus Christ, allowing the Holy Spirit to live in and through us day by day. Amen. That's where we are going to put something, we're going to believe in something bigger than ourselves. As you look at that list, think of how many of those things are present in my life or what needs to change in my life so that I can find more peace of mind in my day-to-day -day activities. The first thing I want you to write down as we continue, uh, we're going to go back to Luke 1. We started there last week talking about Elizabeth and Zechariah 
and we're going to continue there. But I want you to write this down, God's favorite. God's favorite. Let me just tell you, some people believe God plays favorites. I've, I've, you know, people say, oh, God's going to take care of you because you're a pastor. God doesn't take care of me any more significantly or specially than he takes care of you. Why? Because I'm just a child of God. And I'm just doing what he told me to do. And you're a child of God, so do what he tells you to do, and he'll take care of you. That's, uh, that's what I firmly believe. We think, you know, I, I jokingly say I, one of my sister's kids, she's got nine kids, and um, her second to youngest boy, oh, man, that kid, I don't know what it is about him. Every time he walks by me, he waves at me. He's, how old is Moe's? Two. Two years old. Yesterday we were at their house, and he had on this big, uh, you know what the Grand Poobah hats were from the Flintstones? Those big wool hats with horns. He's a little two-year-old, and he's wearing this hat that his dad what fits his dad's head, and his dad's about this big. And so um, he's walking around in this little hat, and he's waving at me, and I always take pictures of him and Instagram him and say he's my favorite. And I've got lots of nieces and nephews, lots of them. But I say he's my favorite, kind of jokingly, mostly serious. But that little kid, I don't know what it is. He'll come up to me and want me to hold him. And I'm like, oh, yes, I'll hold you, you little Mose. He wants to sit with me. He wants to read books with me, all this stuff. So I might play favorites with Moses. But God doesn't play favorites with us. And w- instead of thinking that, you can write next to that. Instead of God's favorite, you could say God's favored. And that's what we're going to look at. There's a, there's a young lady that is favored by God in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. It tells us, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel, the same one that Zechariah fell down afraid of, and the same one that struck him mute, we talked about last week, that same angel was sent by God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by his words and began to wonder about the meaning of this greeting. So the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. That's an incredible statement. You look at the life of Mary, and she is told by the angel Gabriel that she is favored by God. You know, that statement, it says, um, you know, don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Could you imagine an angel showing up to you and saying that? Don't be afraid, Chuck. You found favor with God. I would probably need a depends right at that moment. You know what I'm saying? That would be a, that would be a crazy moment, you know, to happen. If my study of angelic beings in the scriptures is true, it's pretty amazing. It's an interesting side note. If you remember last week, Gabriel showed up in the temple as Zechariah was performing his priestly duties, and Zechariah was, like, afraid, terrified, petrified at what? The sight of this angel. And now you look at Mary, and we can most likely put together— we think of Mary as, like, this, you know, pretty little 20-something. Most likely, Mary was a teenager. And, and, and this time, it was customary for a girl, once she reached about puberty, to be betrothed to a man, to be promised to be someone's husband. And they would live in this life of being technically married, but not consummating their marriage for years, while this man got the house and things together for them to live. And so, this teenage girl has an angel appeared to her, and what's her fear? She's troubled by the words of Gabriel. There's something inside her that the scripture doesn't really tell us fully about, but we can put the clues together. If this priest that had been ministering before God for years and years and years, how do I know that? Because he was old and his wife was old. And he had been faithfully serving in the temple every time his turn came around. And we compare his reaction to the angel Gabriel, and he's scared by the sight of him. And we look at this teenage little girl, Mary. And she's troubled by the words of Gabriel. She has an ability to see beyond just something that is surface. And she says, the Bible says that that she's favored. But why is she favored? Her name itself comes from Miriam, which means exalted one. But is that why she's favored? Because she had the right name? No, I I don't think so. 
Could it be that Mary had just lived such a devout life that we should worship her as many people today believe, that we should pray to her because she's the exalted one, that she's favored by God? I don't think so. Well, how do you know that? Because our salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone. Why? So that none of us can boast of any sort of work, right? So did Mary do the right things to be favored by God? Thanks. She didn't. Thank you, yes. Her favor that was from God was not because of what she had done. We can't go through and look at Mary's life and say that she did the right things to be favored by God. We can only see this young teenage girl that had her life interrupted by an angel, and she received God's favor because it was an act of grace. It was God seeing her and saying, she's the one I'm going to use at this time right here, right now. Gabriel, go and get her ready. Prepare her. So how can you be favored by God? It's an act of receiving his grace. It's an act of accepting his mercy. It's an act of saying, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you and to your ways, as we just sang. You are going to be the anchor for my life. From you and your word, I'm going to base all that I say, do, think, feel, or imagine. And in that moment, you are a favored one of God. You are chosen if you've surrendered your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ and accepted his sacrifice as payment for your sins. Then you're experiencing God's favor. There's many people in our body that can look and say, my life once was headed straight to hell in a handbasket on a greased up ripcord. But God intercepted my life and turned me around, and but by the grace of God, I would be dead or in a gutter somewhere right now. Is it something they did? No. They surrendered their life in a moment, and the grace of God was applied to them. See, you're an ambassador in this dark world, but it's not because of any of your own good deeds. It's only by the grace of God. That same grace of God that favored Mary in that moment is the grace of God that is choosing you now to be his ambassador. The second thing I want you to write down, a son like no other. You see, Mary wasn't just going to be an ordinary mom. She was going to be something that was, that was just like God was bestowing this special favored grace upon her. But it wasn't just so she could have an ordinary son. She was going to have a son like no other. Look what the angel tells her in, in verses 31 to 33. He says, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. You see, Mary wasn't just going to give birth to a king that was going to sit on an earthly throne and be really rich and have lots of land. You know, that would have been Solomon. Solomon was a king that had lots of stuff. He had lots of land. He, he made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem. And he was a great earthly king, but that's not the kingdom that he's inheriting. He's inheriting the, the throne of his father, David. And what do we know about David? David was a man of worship. David was a man of intimacy with God. David wrote a lot of songs that we sing. David wrote a long time ago, and somebody just took what he wrote and kind of adapted it with a little bit of a different tune, right? David was the shepherd boy who came from nothing and became something. David was the one that, that said, uh, you know what, Goliath, you are way bigger than me, and you're way stronger than me, but you're mocking my God, and I'm not going to stand for that. So he went and got some stones and a sling and went against a man whose shield alone was as tall as a regular man and whose spear was the size of a weaver's beam. David was a man of faith, right? He says he's going to take this throne of his father, David. Gabriel tells Mary she's got a really important job, that God has placed on her this special measure of grace and favor so that she could bear a son that would be like no other son. And this task would seem impossible. Why? Because we learn in a little bit that Mary is a virgin. And we know biology doesn't work that way. We are not asexual creatures, meaning that we can self-replicate and produce our own selves. 
It doesn't work that way. God designed us differently, but in this special moment, he was going to have a son be born like no other because this son would be conceived in a way like no other son has ever been conceived. She would give birth to the son of God. That way he could truly say that God was his father. Joseph was his earthly father, and Joseph had a hand in raising this boy, Jesus, I'm sure. But he wasn't his father. And I'm sure Jesus never said, you're not my dad. You know, I'm just saying, that's just, uh, I've heard that a time or two. And I don't think Jesus did that. You see, hundreds of years before Gabriel showed up to talk to Mary, the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to write a prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us. His shoulders, uh, he shoulders responsibility and is called extraordinary strategist, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. His dominion will be vast and he will bring immeasurable prosperity. He will rule on David's throne and over David's kingdom, establishing it and strengthening it by promoting justice and fairness. From this time forward and forevermore, the Lord's intense devotion to his people will accomplish this. You know, you might have a a sticker. You've seen stickers that say, my kid's an honor roll student at such and such school. If Mary had a car and had a bumper sticker on it, Your little honor roll sticker would be nothing. My son is the Prince of Peace. My son is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. My son is the Everlasting Father. My son is going to set up a kingdom that will never end and whose, whose prosperity will be bigger than you could ever imagine. She would need like one of those big buses and probably put the sticker on the side to make it fit to where people could read it. She would be driving a school bus, and it would be wraparound LED lights that would just Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So take that, all you other mothers, that my kid is the best. But we know Mary probably wouldn't have done that. That's just how we would would do it today, you know. But could you imagine being in Mary's place and trying to bear this burden of responsibility herself? Why do you think God said the Lord's favored one? Because he was about to place on her a task that would crush a normal teenage girl. She said she's going to need some extra grace to carry this because this son like no other is going to be conceived in a way like no other. And he's going to be born in a way like all of us were born, the Bible says. But he was going to live a life like no other. I'm going to give her some extra grace. The Lord's presence with Mary guaranteed that his help would be with her to fulfill the assignment he had given. And God's presence and favor gave Mary the peace in the midst of this amazing moment. My question this morning is, where is your peace? What is anchoring your soul? In this world around us, it just seems to get darker and darker and more troubled and more troubled. and, and, And the news just gets worse and worse. Where's your foundation? What's holding your peace? If you had taken yourself out of this moment right here and now and put yourself in Mary's shoes over 2,000 years ago, if Gabriel shows up, would you have the same peace that she had? You see, Jesus is known, it says Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. This son like no other, one of his names is the prince of peace. And if you need peace, he'll give it today. You know, if you're still wrestling with who you are in Christ, look at the last part of this verse right down here at the bottom. Why is this going to happen? Why is Jesus going to be, why, you know, we sing, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Why is that going to happen? Because the Lord's intense devotion to his people will accomplish this. The Lord is devoted to, to you. Do you see that's what it says? The Lord's intense devotion. You know, we give devotion sometimes. We give oftentimes half-hearted devotion to things in this world. We say, oh yeah, I'm going to do it, and then we don't do it. I'm going to pray for you, then we don't pray for them. You know, we, we live this half-hearted devotion of life. Oh, I love this show. Then we watch, we miss like 
15 episodes and then we've got to binge watch it on Netflix when it comes around because we're not devoted to one thing, right? We, we're, we're here and we're there and we're like, thank God for Netflix and Amazon Prime because I would miss all my shows. I have to binge watch them over a weekend to catch up. But that's not the, the devotion of the Lord to us, is it? It says the Lord's intense devotion will accomplish this. How intensely devoted is he? Well, he's going to send Gabriel, an angel, a very important messenger of God, to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Why? Because John, who we know as John the Baptist, is going to be born and prepare the way for the Messiah. And then that same Gabriel is going to come to this virgin, Mary, who's betrothed to Joseph, and say, you're going to have a baby, and you're going to name him Jesus, and he's not going to be like any other baby ever born. He's going to change governments and craft history in a way so that the Messiah could be born at the right time in the right place. Why? Because he's intensely devoted to you so that your sins could be paid for. God is devoted to you. He has an intense devotion that you become all that you're supposed to become in Christ. He's committed to seeing his people accomplish tasks that are bigger than themselves. How do you know that? Well, Mary didn't have her strength to conceive the Messiah, to carry him, or to see him born in her own self. That was something way bigger than her, and God did it. What is God calling you to do? See, I firmly believe that Jesus, I'm calling him a son like no other because he's called us to be a people of God like no other. In a time like none other in history, when you can read Revelation and literally imagine this happening in our world, in our time, I believe that God is calling his people to something bigger than themselves. And it's only to be accomplished because he's given a son like no other, Jesus, for us. The third thing I want you to write down as we uh, continue reading, I've already alluded to, that's not supposed to happen. You know, God can talk to us, and our first response could be, God, that's not how it's supposed to go. You know what? Mel said she would never marry a CBC student, such a Bible college student. She had met plenty, and, and she was not going to marry a redhead. And the Lord brought her a husband that was a CBC graduate and a redhead. Right? So I'm just saying, never say never, because you, Lord, I'll never move to Hawaii and pastor a church. I'll just never, never will do that, God. Now, let me just tell you this. Our response too often is, but that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> Look what happens here in verse 34, Luke 1. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I've not had sexual relations with a man? Translation, that's not supposed to happen. Verse 35, Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy he will be called the son of God. And look, your relative Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son in her old age. Although she was called barren, she's now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. Verse 38, so Mary said, yes, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Mary's first response was, wait, that's not supposed to happen. I've not been with a man. I can't have a son. And Gabriel's response to her was it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will cause you to be, conceive a child. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and this son will be placed in your womb. That's my translation. You see, like I said, Mary was committed to Joseph. She was betrothed to him to be uh, her husband, yet they hadn't consummated their marriage, and this was a common thing in Israelite in the first century in Israel. You see, they, they had not yet come together, and so that they knew that this was not going to be a child born or conceived the way that children are naturally conceived. This would be something different. Why? Because the angel says, this son will be holy. What's holy mean? Separated for a specific purpose. You, you know what that's, that's what holy means. Separated for a specific purpose. We put that in the place of separated for God's purpose. 
And that's what Jesus is, separated for God's purpose. And the way that, that, that Gabriel gave Mary some proof was saying, hey, you know your relative Elizabeth, she's really old and she's been called barren her whole life? She's six months pregnant. Where did we stop off last week? Elizabeth hid herself away for five months. Fast forward a month, and now we're here this week, and Gabriel shows up to talk to Mary. So it says, you know what? Recognize that and realize this truth. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Hallelujah. You know, how many times have you said, that can't happen? That's not supposed to happen. That's not the way it is, God. What's his response to you today? For nothing will be impossible with God. And we, we, have, to, we have to see things in a way that we can understand. So we kind of make these parameters around God to say, God, this is who you are. It's funny, my kids, Maren is the most inquisitive, my youngest. She asks all the time, you know, is, is God a man or a woman? I, neither. And, you know, how does a six-year-old understand that? You know, I don't know. I, I can't explain it. Well, does he, does he have like a beard? No. Is he really big? Oh, yeah. What is God? Um, a spirit. Yeah, how, how do you, how do you, I don't know. And she just kind of said, okay, I don't know if she's just like whatever dad or she's just taking that as truth. But in our adult minds, we have to put these parameters around God and say, this is who God is. This is how I hear from God. This is, you know, what I think about God. This is what God can do. And if anything falls outside of those boundaries, then not going to happen. And God's response is to your, it's not supposed to be that way, is nothing is impossible with God. No circumstances is too big for him. No problem can overwhelm him. He's not caught off guard by the situations of your life. He knows everything that's going on. And so you can have peace today. Because of that truth, nothing is impossible with God. You can have peace today. If you put yourself in Mary's shoes, I bet you'd be really stressed out. You're the pregnant virgin. And it's not like, not like Jane the Virgin, the CW show where the girl gets accidentally inseminated or whatever. It's, it's not that way. She didn't show up to a fertility clinic and accidentally get a baby. You know, that didn't happen. The Holy Spirit did it. And so, you know, you could imagine Mary is living in a culture where the law still says if you've committed adultery, again from Guardians of the Galaxy, finger to the throat means death. That's in case you didn't know what that means. That's, I'm telling you, it's a funny movie. I'm just saying. Um, she could be stoned. She could be murdered because of this. Imagine how stressed out you'd be. You know, thinking about this, well, Joseph's probably going to leave me. He's, is Joseph going to believe this story that an angel showed up and told me I'm going to get pregnant and have a, a son that's like no other son ever? But look at her response. This is what tells me there's something going on in Mary that's like no, like not normal for people. Her response, so Mary said, yes, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. She had peace and knew that God had selected her for something incredible. I pray that the same peace be evident in your life. John Piper, in writing a, a devotional about this passage, said, The key that unlocks the treasure chest of God's peace is faith in the promises of God. So Paul prays in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And when we do trust in the promises of God, have joy and peace and love, then God is glorified. Let me read that one more time. The key that unlocks the treasure chest of God's peace is faith in the promises of God. So Paul prays, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And when we do trust the promises of God, we have hope and peace and love then God is glorified. Do you realize you can glorify God in having peace? In the midst of tragedy, in the midst of life's difficulties, in the midst of hard circumstances, 
when you carry peace to those situations, you can glorify God. How is that? Because you're saying, God, I know you're in control. I know you're still sovereign. I don't care what the doctor's report says. I don't care what my boss says. I don't care what this person says. You're in control. And I know that nothing is impossible with God. So I can have peace. See, Mary was favored by God, but you can be too. Jesus was born to be a son like no other so that you could be a child of God like no other. Mary was the pregnant virgin to show that with God, nothing is impossible. He can take your situation that seems impossible and give you peace today. Let's stand together this morning. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord God, I thank you that in the hustle and the bustle and the busyness of this Christmas season, Lord, I thank you that in you we can have hope. And today we've seen that we can have peace in you today. Lord God, I know that the enemy wants to come in and, and you told us his purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And oftentimes that is seen in bringing discouragement and despair in common situations of life. Jesus, your response was that you have come so that we may have life and life to the full. And I believe that a foundation of that is peace in who you are. And Lord God, I pray that your peace cover us today and overwhelm us today. In Jesus' name.